hearts, thank you for joining us today for Bible study. Our scripture will come from Psalms 86, verses 11 through 13. It reads, Teach me your ways, O Lord, that I may live according to your truth. Grant me purity of heart, so that I may honor you. With all my heart I will praise you, O Lord my God. I will give you glory. I will give glory to your name forever. For your love for me is very great. You have rescued me from the depths of death. Again, the New Living Translation, Psalm 86, verses 11 through 13. Verse 12 reads, With all my heart I will praise you, O Lord my God. I will give glory to your name forever. Thank you now. We honor you, Father God. We glorify you. Lord, we lift your name. We thank you for being good and being God. We thank you for another privilege to study your word, Father God. We ask you to forgive us for your sins, for our sins, and bless us, Father God, that nothing will be held against us as we approach you. Lord, we pray, Father God, that your word will saturate our hearts, that your word will become real to us, and that we will run and tell men, women, boys, and girls about your word. It's in the precious, mighty name of Jesus Christ we pray, and we ask it all. Amen and thank God. Praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. From the rising of the sun to the going down the same and everything that has breath praise the Lord praise the Lord praise the Lord hallelujah hallelujah to the Lamb well we thank God for who he is and what he's already done we praise the almighty God Well, we thank Sister Davis and Ido, little one. Thank you so much for, for uh, Sophia for being a part of our service tonight and carrying on our service. Amen. The Bible teaches that we ought to train them up as, we, as they should go. And when they're old, they would not depart from it. We videotaped Sophia making her first stand on tonight. Amen. She's, she's on the World Wide Web already making her first stand. Thank you so much. Sophia is really coming out of that shell, isn't she? She's coming. If she's not coming out voluntarily, Sister Davis got about her leg just pulling up. <laughs> she's, <laughs> she's being pulled out of her shell. And that's a blessing. That's a good thing. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Sophia. Why don't we thank God for Sophia? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. We like that kind of carrying on. Amen. We're in John chapter 5 again. John chapter 5. Uh, we will begin tonight at verse number 6. We'll begin at verse number 6 and we'll see where, where we end up. Amen. This pericope stops at verse 13, but we'll see where we end up. John is still talking to Christians, to Christians. He's letting them know that who you are in Christ, don't forget it. We oftentimes tell our children, don't forget who you are. Don't forget from which you have come. So the Apostle John reminds Christians tonight to not forget who you are. Talks about how certain we ought to be in Christ Jesus. We ought to be in Christ Jesus who we are and know who we are and bless the Lord in who we are. Amen. So we ought to know who we are in Christ Jesus. Let's start at verse number six. We've, we've already talked about the fact that Christ is real. Christ is, is the one we have our faith in and we ought to be obedient to him. Amen. We ought to be obedient to him. So 1 John chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5, verses 9 through 13 is where we're going to look tonight. 1 John, did I mess up something? 1 John chapter 5. Verses 6 through 13 is where we are. Amen? 1 John chapter 5, verses 6 through 13. You'll find these words. This is he who came by water and blood. Who is he? Jesus Christ. This is he who came by water and blood. Jesus Christ. Not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness because the spirit is truth. He says to us that Jesus Christ is the one who came by water and blood. Came by water, agua, and he came by blood. Are you with me? So he came by water and blood. There are several different theological arguments on what John is talking about. So I'm going to stick with the one I believe. When he says that Jesus has come by water and blood, remember, he says he has come. He has come by water and blood. And if you look at the Bible, the Bible is crystal clear when it says that Jesus came unto John to be baptized. And he was baptized by water. His ministry began by the baptism of water. Jesus is an example of how we ought to be baptized. The Bible says he went straight way into the water. He went all the way down into the water. He wasn't sprinkled. He wasn't sped up on. He was baptized through immersion all the way under the water. And because Jesus was baptized all the way under the water, then once we receive Jesus Christ as our personal savior, then we ought to proceed to being baptized all the way under the water. As we walk in Christ, as we are, are referring to Christ, as we are children of God, we ought to proceed to be baptized. And this baptism is in water. It is a sheet of water. It is the symbol of a waterly grave, a watery grave. And so when we are baptized, we are saying that we are being baptized by the profession of our faith. And the fact that we believe that Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose from the dead. So what he's saying is, that we are being baptized by water. And when we stand in the water with the deacon or with the preacher or with the ordained person, and while we're standing there, we have come to confess our, our conviction in Christ Jesus. So when we stand there, Sister Cora going to give her extra $10 for her phone ringing in the middle of church service. So when we stand there, 
When we stand there, we have come to say we believe the story and we have received Jesus Christ in our lives. Then when the preacher pronounces, by the profession of your faith and your obedience to the great head of the church, the great head of the church is Jesus Christ. When we believe this story, we are saying to the people, we believe that Jesus died, Jesus was buried, Jesus rose from the dead. So when one is taken down into the water, they are confessing that we believe or they believe or he or her believe that he or she believes that Jesus died and he was buried. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. When the preacher, the deacon, or whatever person is ordained that baptizes you, takes you into the water, you're saying, I believe that Jesus died and he was buried. When you're brought up from the water, you're saying that you believe that Jesus not only died and was buried, you believe that he rose from the dead. Therefore, the preacher, deacon, whatever person brings you up, brings you up and you're saying to the congregation standing out there, I believe that Jesus rose from the dead. So Jesus came. He came by water and he came by blood. So the symbol here is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is why we are baptized. We believe that story. And when people come from far and near to witness our baptism, what we are saying is, come celebrate with me. Come celebrate this new life. What we are saying is that we believe the story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and I'm willing to show it to you. I'm willing to demonstrate to you what I really believe. So Jesus was, he came by water. Now, you need to know that the water does not save one. You are not saved because you are baptized. You are baptized because you are saved. 1 John chapter 5, verse number 6 is where we are. This is he who came by water and blood. So everybody with me? This is a symbol of Jesus Christ's baptism. Then he says he came by blood. When Jesus died on Calvary, he died through crucifixion on Calvary. He was already dead, and then the soldier stood up and pierced him in his side. What came out of his side? Blood and water. The blood is what cleanses us. The blood is what really saves us. You sing the song every, every first Sunday at least. You probably sing it during the week, I'm sure. What can wash away our sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make us whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. That is something to shout about even on Wednesday. That's enough to shout about. Jesus' blood has made us whole. It's nothing but the blood. It's Jesus' blood because no man, no woman, no creature, no king, no governor, no president can save us. It's Jesus' blood that saves us. He paid the ransom for us over 2,000 years ago on Calvary. So it says, Jesus came. He says, this is he who came by water and blood, hyphen, Jesus the Christ. Jesus Christ. Jesus, the Son of God. Then it goes on to explain, not only by water, not by water only, not only by water, so it's not water by itself did he come, but by water and blood. So it's not enough for us to know that Jesus came and was baptized into water. We must realize that he died on Calvary and outflowed his blood. 
You trying to want you you wondering why you act like you a Christian now? It's because it's blood. You're trying to figure out why you are brand new and people can see that you're brand new? It's because of his blood. Back home, the senior saints would say it like this. I looked at my hands and they looked brand new. I looked at my feet and they did too. As a boy, I'm wondering, now the same wrinkled hands you have when you walked in here, you still have. What they were really saying is, the things I used to do with my hands, I don't do them anymore. The places my feet used to take me, I don't, they don't take me there anymore. The way I we used to think, the way I used to act, I don't act that way anymore. Anybody been redeemed till you've been changed? That, that other folk know you changed? That you know you've been changed? Guess what it took? His blood. It's the blood of Jesus that has saved us and made us who we are. It says, not only by water, but by water and by blood. And it is the spirit who bears witness because the spirit is truth. He begins this statement in the New King James. He says, it is the spirit. Now, because he begins the, the phrase or the sentence by saying it is the spirit, he's not saying the spirit it. Because if you look at it, he says, it is the spirit who bears witness. It is the spirit, the person, the third person of the triune God. It is the spirit of God who bears witness because the spirit is truth. So he goes back and he says that Jesus has come. Jesus has given, he has come by water. He's come by blood. He's given his life for you and he's given his life for me. He rose from the dead. He's gone on up to heaven. He's sitting on the right hand of the father. He's making intercession for us. When we confess our sins and we are repentant of our sin, Jesus keeps us. No one can keep us but him. And it says the spirit, he, the spirit, the third person of the triune God, the spirit, God himself, God, the spirit, bears record. God, the spirit, is the witness that Jesus has done what he has done and that Jesus is who he is. The spirit of God. So Jesus is no longer here in the flesh, right? But he has, he has sent for the comforter, the Holy Spirit, and the comforter is here. Does anybody know that the comforter is here? The comforter is real. The comforter, the Holy Spirit is here. He is real in our lives. The songwriter says he walks with me. He talks with me. And he tells me that I am his own. Guess what he's telling us too? You are wrong. You are right. Stop. Start. Don't do that. Do this. The spirit of God unctions us. And he is the spirit of truth. There's no error in him. He is the God of truth. The spirit of God is a witness. You ought to have a, a witness in your spirit. You ought to have a witness. God's spirit ought to be a witness in your spirit. You ought to trust him. He is intelligent. He is amazing. He is excellent. He is God. And we already found out John says that God is love. So the spirit leads us to operate in love regardless of how we feel about it. Regardless of what we go through, the spirit of God unctions us, leads us, he protects us. But foremost, he has given witness that Jesus Christ is the one who gives us life. Let's see if it says that. Verse number seven. For there are three who bear witness in heaven. And then he names them. 
the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. Some translations said these three agree as one. If you read the holy translations of the Jehovah's Witnesses, they will say these three agree as one. What they're trying to say is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are not one. The text declares that they are one. And the reason why they're trying to say that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are not one, they ask the question, well, when Jesus was here, who was in heaven? If they are one. Since Jesus is now in heaven and the Spirit is here, then where is God? They are one. You see, we can't be all places at the same time, but God can. And God is. He is the Holy Spirit. And the thing about the Holy Spirit, the thing about Jesus, the thing about God the Father, they never have a disagreement. They are never confused. The Holy Spirit did not enter into mankind until Jesus left the scene. The Holy Spirit does not govern this earth, did not start governing believers until Jesus left the scene. As a matter of fact, before the earth was created as we know it today, the Holy Spirit hovered over it. Genesis. The Holy Spirit hovered over the earth. Now where is the Holy Spirit? He lives in us. And he lives in all of us who are born again, all of us who are saved. And he is the spirit of truth. He is truth. And this truth bears witness that Jesus Christ is the only one who can give us salvation. He bears witness. Bear, this word witness means record. He bears witness. He, he bears testimony. And guess what? His testimony is true. Have you ever wondered when people go to court and yet they're on two opposing teams and every time they get to the witness stand, they raise their right hand and they say, you, you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. And they all say, I will. I do. Now, we're on two opposing teams. We both swear to tell the truth. But our testimony are totally opposite the other. And then you leave a jury and a judge there to decide which one of y'all really telling the truth. But if you really, really listen closely, they'll tell it off on themselves every time. So the truth comes from the Holy Spirit. People say stuff like this. The Holy Spirit hit me. What's wrong with that? Is there anything wrong with the Holy Spirit hit me? Okay, you feel the Spirit? Okay. So what's wrong with him hitting you? Does he hit you? People testify that they hit, he hit them. Does the Holy Spirit hit you? Some people say, oh, do, do you catch the Holy Spirit? I'm just asking a question. I'm just, I'm just, I caught the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit hit me. The Holy Spirit caught me. Brother Miles, when the last time you caught the Holy Spirit? Was he running? Had he been hit by a bat and you caught him? Does anybody catch the Holy Spirit? I, nobody's going to admit tonight they catch the Holy Spirit. Do you catch him? Does he hit you? Somebody said no. How many people don't know and don't want to say you don't know? Raise your hand if you don't want to say you don't know. Okay, okay, I got one. So the Holy Spirit does not hit us. We don't catch the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells within us once we are saved. And when he dwells within us, he speaks to us. And it may be a, a simple, small voice. But he speaks to us. He teaches us. He's our leader, teacher, comforter, and our guide. He's our leader, teacher, comforter. He's our guide. 
So does your GPS hit you? Do you catch your GPS? But your GPS leads you. And check this out. It says the spirit is the spirit in truth. He is truth. And he's the spirit of truth. But your GPS is not the spirit of truth. Because one GPS led a man, he's following GPS and led him right into the bayou. Drove his car right into the bayou. He was following GPS. Now, Sister Davis is a stickler for GPS. And when I get in there, I say, I ain't doing that. I'm not, I'm not doing that. I know where I'm going. And she wants me to put on GPS. And GPS takes you all the way around 610. It's almost like GPS is in cahoots with the gas stations. <laughs> now, I'm coming to 4251 Shermar Road from Missouri City. I jump right on the Beltway or ride the feet of the get here. But the GPS is going to tell me to go up Main, hit, hit Gessner, get on 59, go down by Sharpstown Mall, then come here and get here an hour later. And I look at it and I stroll and make it small enough to see the whole path. I said, I'm not doing that. Because the GPS is not truth. But the Holy Spirit is truth. He never leaves us wrong. He allows to get into some stuff. But even when he allows us to get into some stuff, guess what? He's already warned us, don't turn that way. The last time the Holy Spirit spoke to Sister Wood, he said, she said, he said, don't go to that man's house. Now, I don't know if she did or not, but he said, the Holy Spirit said, leave that man alone. <laughs> I even told her to leave it. <laughs> oh my goodness, Sister, Sister Davis, Davis about to fall out of her seat. <laughs> the Holy Spirit has already spoke to us. I wasn't even gonna go there. The Holy Spirit has already said, "Leave it alone. Don't touch it." Oftentimes, I refer to the sheriff back home in Mississippi. He, he would come on right before children would go to bed, and he would do his little, little talk to children. And at the end of his talk, he would say, if you find a gun, leave it alone. Don't touch it, tell an adult. If you find a gun, leave it alone. Don't touch it, tell an adult. If you find a gun, leave it alone. Don't touch it, tell an adult. He's warning us bad things going to happen if you don't obey. The Holy Spirit is warning us bad things are going to take place if you don't obey. Let me tell you a secret. Some of the things we're praying about, we shouldn't have to pray about. Because you shouldn't do it. I'm telling you some of the things my parents and grandparents prayed for me about, they had no been in having to pray about it. But because they prayed, now I stand before you. But they shouldn't have to have prayed about it. When I was climbing up Fool's Hill, they were praying for me. But if I had just listened to the Holy Spirit, they wouldn't have to have prayed for me. He's the spirit of truth. He tells us what we need to know. And if you are not having those type of experiences with God, you need to spend some more time with him. Henry Backerby, Henry Backerby, Blackerby, wrote a book called Experiencing God. And in the 90s, it was, a, it was a, a book that every church all over the world almost was looking at. And it was called Experiencing God. And one of the subject matters in Henry Backerby's book was the fact that you will have a crisis of belief. Meaning that bad things happen to good people. Meaning that bad things happen to you even when you're doing what's right. It's called a crisis of belief. It means that you are at that moment in your life where you pray to God, you've asked God, and you're still going through. Let me tell you my crisis of belief. We were, we were having fam, uh, fasting and praying at the Holman Street Church. And it was, let's say, 30, 21 day, fasting and praying. I remember day four like never, nothing else. 
I mean, day four, I was fasting and praying, and I just asking Lord for what I wanted, and, and, and I was telling God what I was going to change, and, and I was sincere about it, and day four was the worst day of my life during that time. I mean, I'm, I'm into it. I've gotten past day two when it was really hard, when the, when the hunger pains really hit. And when we were fasting, we weren't drinking water. We weren't eating vegetables. See, you all get off simple here. Y'all get off easy here. We weren't drinking water. We weren't, we weren't drinking, we weren't drinking Kool-Aid, coffee. We, we weren't eating pork, beef. We, we weren't eating any food for 21 days. And boy, I had gotten past day two. Things were going well. And I got laid off my job on day four. 600 miles from home. No family here. Here I am in touch with God and God is in touch with me. I'm experiencing God and God is experiencing all of my troubles, all my pain. I'm giving it all to God. I have really laid it all on the altar and I get laid off my job. Uh, 600 miles from home. No family within sight. It's called a crisis of belief. The question becomes, will you continue to believe God? Will you continue to trust God? Will you continue to walk with God as you go through your crisis of belief? Here at Blackaby explains it like this. When you're at your toughest moment, God is still in the room. God is still present. God is still walking with you. Dark clouds outside right now. We, we were in the process of welcoming Sister, Sister Ann Paul back to Bible study. It started raining. She trying to come out here and get back home before darkness set in. It got dark at six o'clock. I mean, trying to do the right thing, asking God to bless. And I mean, just have an urge for God to feed me. And God, I'm going to make this sacrifice. And you know, God, I'm almost 80 years old and I'm going up there anyhow. And then it gets dark. Then it starts pouring down raining. And then just a few seconds ago, it thundered and everybody almost left the room. If I had paid it any attention, we would have been empty by now. <laughs> if I had said anything, if I had stopped in any way, I mean, the crisis of belief would have taken over. The crisis would have taken over the belief. But here we are. We have the spirit of God and he's the spirit of truth. And we want him to keep walking with us. We want to trust him in the good times and the bad times. Trust him. Verse 7 says, For there are three who bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. Who is the Word here? Jesus is the Word. John chapter 1, John, St. John chapter 1, John says, In the beginning was the Word. In the Word... Verse 14 became flesh. In the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. And verse 14 says, and the word became flesh and dwelled among us. He walked on these mundane shores. He's the word. So there are three that bear witness in heaven. God the Father, God the Son, Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. Verse 8. And there are three that bear witness on earth. The Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. There are three that bear witness on earth. Why didn't it say God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? It said God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit bear witness in heaven. 
But then it doesn't come back and say the same thing on earth. But on earth it says, and there are three that bear witness on earth. God the spirit, there's the water, and the blood, and these three agree as one. Remember, when you go back to verse number eight, he's talking about Jesus, right? And because he's talking about Jesus, Jesus has left here. John chapter four, John chapter four, John says that Jesus said that I got to leave you, but I will send you the comforter. So the comforter, the spirit is on earth and the spirit bears witness of Jesus. He bears witness of Jesus. He, he bear record of Jesus. He agrees with Jesus. Check this out. As a father, as a husband, as a, a co-worker, sometimes I disagree with myself. Because if I'm in the role as a co-worker and I'm in the role as a father and I'm in the role as a husband, I can't apply everything at home that I apply at work. And every now and then I have to remind Sister Davis what she applied with them chilling, she can't apply with me. Some people would say chilling, others would say cheering. So we have to understand regardless of who we are and what role we're playing, we got to know how to switch roles. But God the Father, he knows what he is, who he is, and what he's trying to do and what he's trying to do through you. It says these three agree as one. In other words, there is no conflict in God on, on earth nor in heaven. So the spirit bears record on earth. The water by, bears record on earth. And the blood bears record on earth. And all of them are still pointing to Jesus. Are you with me? Questions or comments? So these three agree. I just can't, the three roles that I play, the three positions I hold, the three conversations I have, all three of them are different. But when you look at God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they are one. When you look at the Spirit, the water, and the blood, they agree on the same thing. They walk in unity. And everybody's pointing to Jesus. Everything's pointing to Jesus. The water, the blood, the spirit agree as one. There's no conflict. My daughter was growing up, she would always try to tell me, I don't want to hear from the preacher right now. I want to hear from my daddy. So what was she saying to me? What, what, what are you all saying when y'all say that? I don't want to hear from the preacher right now. What are you saying? I want to hear from my daddy. I want to, what does that mean? Oh, don't talk about the Bible. But what if the daddy believes in the Bible? What if the daddy, I mean, you know, I graduated from a public school in Mississippi. So I'm kind of limited on where I can do and what I can do. So I can't make the change sometime. I can't make the switch sometime. Because I'm dumb enough to think that if I'm daddy, I believe this. And if I'm, I'm the preacher, I believe the same thing. Am I wrong? No. I'm not wrong. I'm all right. So my comments. So what now? The deliverance is different. So how do I deliver it? You deliver it a little softer when you daddy. Oh, when I'm daddy? But what if I believe in corporate punishment? Oh, I just thought I asked a question. Daddy believe in corporate punishment. So, so this is the deal. When I went to school, the assistant principal and the principal and some of the male teachers, especially the coaches, walked around with a pal in their, their, their back pocket and stuck down their belt. It was about this wide, and then it was made like a baseball bat, and then some of them had the nerve to drill holes in it. What happened to them? 
They just kept doing what they did, and then that dinosaur died off. But I turned that off right. Are you with me? So we have to understand, we have to get to a point where we know that God has no disagreement, and the word in the word there's no disagreement. People quote scriptures throughout the whole Bible and then they try to justify this and justify that. But the word never disagrees. You must read it in context and in content. Because it is God's word. And the word of God is God breathed. So the water, the blood, and the spirit all agree. Verse number nine. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he has testified of the Son. In other words, if you can bring yourself to believe what some of the men are saying, some of the women are saying, then the witness that God gives is greater. It's greater. Let me just go here tonight. Very famous preacher has gone out on a limb and said that tithing is not for this day and age. That tithing is not biblical. He said that tithing is not biblical, but he got filthy rich on tithing. I mean, loaded. I mean, anything he could dream of, tithing made it happen. So do we get to a point where we get so wealthy until what made us wealthy doesn't mean anything anymore. No. But I can see him coming a long ways off. Now that tithing, as he say, now that tithing is not for today's congregations, he's going to start grace giving. I don't know if he's mentioned yet, but I know that's where he's headed. And then he's going to explain that grace is higher than the tithe. So now he wants you to go from 10% to 25% consistently. And you, these things you may do, this is what you, you should do based on you and the Holy Spirit. But don't tell us that what made you famous, made you rich, is not for today. And then switch it on us by midstream and say, matter of fact, you got to give me more than you've been getting. So y'all watch the news and see if that's his next move. Are you with me? So what, what we have to understand is the Holy Spirit tells the truth and God's witness is greater than any man's witness. Regardless. God's witness is greater than any man's witness. And if you're going to believe man, you ought to believe God. If you can bring yourself to believe, there are people who risk their lives risk the lives of their families, risk the lives of their, their livelihoods, their jobs, on January 6th behind one lie by one man. And guess what? Not too many have fallen away from it. And they'll tell you, I believed everything he said. And I'm sitting there like, how can you? They lost their job. Houston police officer, one of the first they blasted. He... He's Asian. He doesn't even qualify for the benefits. <laughs> he going to leave Houston. Go to the Capitol. Destroy the Capitol. Talking about hanging Mike Pence. Messed up a good job. A good career. But people will believe men before they will believe God. Whenever you have a person, whether it's the president or the preacher, who does not line up with God's word, do not follow him. You know, a lot of guys have this rhema word now. It's a new thought word. I got this rhema word. Well, if you have a rhema word, where is that word in the word? You don't just think up the word. God has written this word out. It has been canonized. It has been placed in 66 books. And it's enough to preach, to teach, and to live by the rest of your life. Regardless of how old you are. 
but men will believe other men's word, but will not believe God's word. And John says in verse number nine that God's witness, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of his son. Check this out. God doesn't have low self-esteem. <laughs> he doesn't have a problem with testifying of the goodness of his son. Jesus got baptized. Matthew chapter 4, Matthew chapter 3, Matthew chapter 3 and 4. Jesus gets baptized and the Holy Spirit shows up. Lights upon him like a dove. Then God shows up. A voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. This is my beloved son in whom I, I'm well pleased. And somebody with low self-esteem cannot approve anybody else. Some of your cousins got low self-esteem. Because they hate when you do well. They get jealous when you get something else. They get jealous when God blesses you. And God blesses you more than with a new car and new house. God blesses you with favor. And people get jealous because they have low self-esteem. They get, man, how you do that? I grew up with you and that ain't happening like that for me. Well, maybe you need to experience God. Don't get jealous. God is not jealous of the spirit. He's not jealous of the son. He's still God. Some of your friends will turn their backs on you. Because you're doing well. They love to be able to pull you out the ghetto. They love to be able to help you to the, to the bus stop. They love to talk to you when they can pay for your lunch and then brag about it. God doesn't have that kind of attitude. God wants all of us to be promoted. The Bible says that God desires that none should perish, not one. So we got to get out there and talk about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit so we can get people saved. You know, things are happening these days that we in our generations have never seen before. That's right. I mean, things have happened that you have never, ever seen before. I was riding through Stafford. This, this guy just sitting at the light. I'd rather bag up than to blow my horn. I, know that's right. I bagged up. The guy behind me was sitting behind me, so he knew what was going on. He gave me enough room to bag up. I went right around him. He's still sitting at the light. And, you know, sometimes we make a joke about he's just picking his nose. He's literally sitting there picking his nose at the red light. Cars in this lane just zooming by him. He's still sitting there. But we can't afford to blow. We can't afford to holler out the window. You bag up and get out of the way. Let the next guy blow. And guess what? The next guy knew he couldn't blow either. He went around too. And by the time the second car got around him, he stopped picking. He's literally sitting there picking his nose at the red light while everybody else trying to get somewhere. And you can't blow your horn. We've seen stuff, freak accidents happen. I mean, like never before. And we're in the book of Revelation, and this coming Sunday, we're going to deal with the, the four horsemen after we open up the first seal. In Revelation chapter 6, stuff like that's never happened before. It's happening right before our eyes. But guess what? Even though it's never happened before, we've never seen it before, it has been written before. And we just have to read it. I talk, I talk about cliff notes, and oftentimes I, I went to the library when I couldn't find a book. I would go get the cliff notes. And the cliff notes would, would create a summary of the entire book. Now, it's somebody else's take on the book, but it does give me an idea on, on what the book is all about. And then when I do get the book, finally, after somebody else has passed it down, then when I get the book, then I could read the first chapter, the middle chapter, and the last chapter, and I got an idea of how the story ends. Look, I've read the last chapter. 
And the last chapter says, we win. We win. We win. You just got to hang in there. You're going to win. Just, just hang in there. Stay with it. You're going to win. God is the one who testifies of his son. He who believes in the son has God. He who believes in the son has the witness of him in himself. He who does not believe in God, believe God, has made him a liar. Who is him? In other words, people who don't believe in God, don't believe the testimony of God concerning his son, they're saying that God is a liar. They're saying that they are right and God is wrong. Let me tell you what repentance is. Repentance is when you say to God, God, you're right and I'm wrong. God, you are right, I am wrong. And because, God, you are right, I repent of my sins. Because you are right, God, and I'm wrong, God, let me just share something with you. God, you've always been right. And because you've always been right, now, God, you've shown me that I'm wrong. I'm willing to say, God, you're right and I'm wrong. It's hard for some people to say they were wrong. You know anybody like that? I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about somebody you know. You know anybody like that? Just, it's just hard for you to say or somebody to say, I was just wrong. I'm, I'm, I apologize. I'm sorry. Please accept my apology. I'm, I'm wrong. When we repent of our sin, we're saying, God, you're right. I'm wrong. But people will call God a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has given of his son or concerning his son. Verse number 11. And this is the testimony that God has given, each, given us eternal life and this life is in his son. Eternal life is in Jesus and Jesus alone. God has given us eternal life. How long is eternal life? How long? Forever. How long is forever? Eternal. How long is eternal? Everlasting, right? So God has given us everlasting life, eternal life, and this life is in his son and no one else but his son. Nobody else but Jesus. We went on a mission trip. I think it was Czech Republic. And we had a shirt, you know, tensions were high. In the early 2000s, we went on this mission trip and we could, we used to put Mission USA, but this one time we put Mission Brazil and on the back of our shirts in big letters, it said, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. If we make it about Jesus, then we agree with God. If we make it about us, we disagree with God. God is testifying about his son, Jesus, that Jesus has given us eternal life and eternal life is in him and him alone. Verse number 12, he who has the son has life. He who has not the son has not life. He who has the son has life. He who has not the son has not life. So what do you mean? I'm still walking around. I'm still talking. You just existing. If you have not Jesus, you're just existing. When you have Jesus, you have life. This word life is vitality. This word life means you walking in Jesus. Not only is it life now, it's, now, it's life later. And y'all just taught me that this life is eternal life. And you told me eternal life was forever life. And you told me that eternal life was everlasting life. And without Jesus, there is no everlasting life. You can believe Oprah if you want to. Money will send you to hell. Just because a person who has money and fame said it doesn't mean it's right. There's only one way. John chapter 10 says there's one door to the sheepfold. 
And that door is Jesus himself. There's only one way to get in. He who has the Son has life. He who has not the Son does not have life. Verse 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to live. Continue to live is said not to be continued to is said not to be in the original text, but continue to live, continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. He said these things I've written to you that you will believe in the Son of God. I have written these things to you. He said, now I know you're a Christian. I know you're born again. I know you're going to heaven. But it gets a little rocky down here. And he, when John is writing this particular pericope, he's writing it to refute a false doctrine that was being taught. And even today, we fall into false doctrine that says, Eternal life is not everlasting life. Eternal life is not forever life. Eternal life is life that you can lose. Well, how does it be eternal? And we cannot, we cannot take the word and pick out what we want and make it what tradition says. This eternal life comes through Jesus. And the reason why the Bible calls it eternal is because it's from now on. So we get saved one time. It's a one-time affair, one-time event. We're saved forever and ever and ever. It's eternal life. We get saved one time. That's why our leaders write their salvation story. The worst thing we can do is put somebody in leadership that's not saved, that can't remember if they are saved or not. Can't remember the, the situation, the incident, or who led them to Christ. They can't remember even getting to know him. And then they start talking about, I was baptized. But are you saved? Do you have eternal life? Eternal life is life forevermore. It happens one time. You, you get saved one time and one time only. Now, salvation is one time, but sanctification is every day. You ought to be growing in grace every day. What upset you yesterday ought not upset you today. Matter of fact, what upset you last week ought not accept you, upset you this week. Because sanctification is continual growth. Sanctification is growing more and more and more. We go from, the, the old saints would say, Every wrong with Jesus get me higher and higher. I, get, I become more like Jesus every wrong of the ladder I go up. We got to be more like him. Any questions or comments? Did y'all welcome Sister, Sister Paul back to Bible study? Did y'all? Everybody, everybody, thank God for bringing Sister Paul back to Bible study. Even though it got dark on out there, it's... We're going to pray her, her strength in the Lord for traveling grace. If you're here today and you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this is your moment. You ought to try Jesus. You ought to try him because eternal life comes through Jesus and Jesus alone. If you never received him, this is your moment to receive him. Will you just bow your head and repeat after me and invite him into your life? Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We believe if you pray this prayer now, you are born again. We believe that when you die, you go to heaven. When the rapture comes, you will go to heaven. There may be others who are in between church homes or don't have a church home. 
I recommend the New Beginning Church. Jesus says, come, Jesus welcome you. And then there's the group that, in the same group I'm in, where we struggle with sin. We, we have issues that we're going through and we're going through our crisis of belief. And we're wondering, God, are you still there? Let us pray together for each other. Father God, we come now, Lord. We bless your name. God, we thank you for saving our souls. We ask you to bless us to walk closely to you. Lord, we ask you to forgive us for our sins. Bless us, Father God, that we will walk with you in a way that we will grow every day. Give us a hunger, a thirst for your new revelation, for your word, to be closer to Jesus, listening to your Holy Spirit. Bless us to do what the Spirit says and not do what the Spirit says not to do. Strengthen our hearts, bless our minds, and keep us focused. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. I want to thank God for who he is and what he's already done. We serve the awesome and the amazing, the amazing God. On our prayer list tonight, we have Sister Cheryl Barney, Brother Omar Galvan, Kevin and Katrina Whitlock, Nicole Davis and family, Audrey Johnson, Hamina Ortiz, Joe Nathan Brownlee, Ed and Emma Brannon, Megan Davis, and Amity Hunter. During your prayer time, lift them before the Lord that God will bless. Father God, we thank you for these on the prayer list. We ask you to bless their hearts, bless their minds. Speak to them by way of your Holy Spirit. Comfort them, ease their pain, heal their bodies, stop confusion, lead them closer to you. Bless them to stand and understand that you are God and you're God alone. Bless them to know you, Father God, in a mighty way. Bless them to have a testimony of Jesus Christ. For those who are not saved, draw them near to you and save their souls. For those who are saved, Father God, we ask you, Father, to bless them, to turn around, to commit you in their sanctification moments, that you will get the glory, all the honor and all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Amen. It is offering time. It's time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. It is time to give, give to the Lord. It's time to give to the Lord. For those of you who are giving electronically, you can do so by giving by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com is our Zelle account. If you want to mail your offering in, you can do so by mailing it to the New Beginning Church, P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That is P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. For those of you in the room, as you prepare to give, I want to pray, Father God, we ask you to bless our gifts, bless every person that has given, and bless us, Father God, that we will give, not grudgingly, nor out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. In Jesus' name, amen, and thank God. If you have your offering prepared, you can stand now and come and give. Where is he that is in me? 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 Where is he that is in me?
nations in the world. Father, we thank you now for Bible study. We thank you, Father God, for blessing us. We ask you, Father God, to bless us to realize that Jesus is the one who bears record and that the Holy Spirit bears record and the Father bears record. Father God, we ask you to bless us to realize who Jesus is and bless us, Father God, to acknowledge his water, acknowledge his blood, and we thank you, Father God, for blessing us. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, be glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us join each other by saying, Amen. Amen. God bless you and keep you. Thank you so much for visiting with us here on tonight. The, the Zell account, the Zell account, is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com lifting.jesus at yahoo.com the idea is as we lift Jesus he will draw all men unto me our zeal account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com thank you so much and God bless you